Welcome to Oak Bridge City. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here and I am super excited uh, to worship. And before we do, I want to share a story that some of you guys have heard, but if you've started coming to Oak Bridge City um, since we opened about a year ago, you have not heard this story. And so it was about four years ago, uh, Abby and I were... um, we're, we're in the process of closing on our house. We're engaged at this point. We're getting a house in Afton. Um, actually, we are like located 100 yards from uh, what's going to be the first ever food truck garden in Missouri. So that's pretty cool. Um, and so we went to Afton and we were closing our house and we we're all excited. And so what we were doing is we were kind of scoping out the neighborhood. And, and we were driving around, we were knocking on doors, saying hi, introducing ourselves. And so there's one day, it was Abby and I, we were like, let's go and kind of, let's go by the house. And it was before we had, we were able to, or I was able to move in. And so, so we're driving around and, uh, and our house is on the very kind of like beginning of the street, right when you pull in. And so we drive all the way to the end, and then there's this like little turnaround spot. And about two houses before the cul-de-sac, um, there were some people out, and they were our age, and then there were a couple young ones, and I was all excited. I'm like, this is awesome. This is really cool. Some people our age. And so as I was driving by, I just gave them a soft smile. Gave them a soft smile because I knew we were going to be turning around a second, and I was going to wave then. I didn't want to wave twice. I thought that would look a little bit desperate. And so I give a soft smile, we turn around, and I start waving. And where I come from, waving just means hello, right? Like it just means hi. But apparently they took it another way, and, and, and one of the guys on the front porch starts screaming at me, okay? And I can hear it through the windows. He's cussing. He's going wild. It's like, what the blank are you looking at? What the blank are you looking at, you blankety? And so he's like going wild. I'm like, Abby, go, 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 right? Like she takes off. We get down to the house. We stop. And I don't know what it is. I'm not much of a fighter, but something kind of mustered up inside of me. And I'm like, I'm going to go down there. I'm going down there. And so I get out of the car. I have a pink shirt on, no joke. Uh, I have some skinny jeans on and I walk down the street like I own the neighborhood and, uh, and, and, and as I get a few houses away, I'm just, go, I'm just gonna go, I'm just gonna go apologize for waving. I'm gonna let them know, hey, we, we, don't, we, don't, we aren't gonna do this anymore on Charlton Lane. Like, like we're gonna be unified. We're gonna be a nice neighborhood. We're gonna wave to one another. And so I'm on my way down to the house. I'm like three houses. Okay, I walk all the way down there. The guy starts screaming at me again. What are you looking at? What are you looking at? He walks inside. The other people start laughing and I'm like, well, I didn't, didn't see that one coming, right? Like, that's not why I walked all the way down here. And so I turn around, literally, that's what happened. I turn around without saying really a word, and I get back to Abby, and she's like, how'd it go, tough guy? How'd it go? How'd it go, Josh? I'm like, it was really good, actually. They're coming to church this week. Um, <laughs> but the question, the question that he asked me is what I want to ask this morning as we jump into a new year. And, uh, and it's, it's, what are you looking at, okay? And I'm not going to say it in the way that he said it, okay? But what are you looking at as we jump into 2020? In 2019, what were your eyes fixed on? What, what did you focus on most? Because what you think on most, what you focused on most, what gets most of your attention is really what you are worshiping. And so what are you thinking about? What are your eyes fixed on? And far too often in this world, it becomes where we're fixed on the stresses. Our eyes are fixed on the darkness of our world. Our eyes are are fixed on narratives that are kind of contrary to the gospel. Our, Our eyes are 
fixed on politics and all these different things. And, and, and I'm not acting like you got to lock yourself in a basement and just have your Bible. That's not how it is. We're in the world and there are times where you're going to look at different things. But none of them, none of them are as good as Jesus. Jesus is a whole lot better than anything that you could possibly fix your eyes on, which is why I love worship. Worship literally gives us an opportunity. In fact, it leaves us no choice to, to, put, to get our eyes off of ourselves and our circumstances and onto God and His goodness and His grace. And so I wanna challenge you, if your eyes have been fixed elsewhere, if you haven't thought about Jesus much, maybe since the new year even began, I wanna give you an opportunity. I just wanna invite you to think about the lyrics, to sing the lyrics, to ask God to help you believe the lyrics, to fix your eyes on Jesus, because what you're fixing your eyes on, it just doesn't compare to him. He loves you. He died for you. He rose from the dead victorious over your sin and the death that you deserved to die. And he is worthy of all of our praise. And with that said, I'm gonna pray. Father, we worship you this morning. It's why we're here. As Jesus followers, it's why we're here, to give you honor, to give you glory. If nothing else takes place in the room, it was worth coming. Just to sing, just to praise, just to celebrate what you have done for us. And God, if we aren't sure about this whole Jesus thing and we're in the room today, that's okay. Help us maybe have the courage to tear down some walls in our hearts and our minds just to even read the words on the screen, to contemplate what this story of Jesus could possibly mean for our lives and for our world. Jesus, we thank you that these words are true. We thank you that you call us, that you invite us to look at Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so God, I pray that we do so in the next 15 or so minutes as we sing and as we celebrate the greatest story of all time. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray.
have a seat. Um, first off, welcome. My name's Kelsey. It's so good to finally be back together. I feel like it's been forever. Like, haven't seen you guys in like a decade. I had to, I'm sorry. Anyway, a um, few announcements before we get started. If you're visiting, this is your first time at either Oak Bridge location. First off, welcome. We are so happy you're here, but we have a few announcements. First off, there's no offering in service. Um, that's by design. We ask that you not give and let this service be our gift to you. But if you call Oak Bridge your home, there are joy boxes throughout the campus, and there's also giving online. And then also, there's no communion in service, but there is a room called the Reflection Room where there's communion available right down that hallway. So um, that'll be open right after service if you want to stop in there. 
And then also, we would love for you to stop by the Info Center, say hi. Um, we have a team there that would love to give you a tour, answer any questions, and then also get you a free t-shirt for you and everyone who's with you today. So make sure you do that. Um, speaking of a new decade, we are, we just were doing the um, Be Rich campaign last year where we were asking everyone to give $40 so that we could be the hands and feet of Jesus and just support a lot of charities in the St. Louis area. That is still going on. So if you didn't get a chance to participate, it is not too late. We are asking that every member of your family gives $40. And like I said, we can just be um, the hands and feet of Jesus in our community. Um, also, coming up next week, we have Starting Point sign up. So, if you've never been through Starting Point here, if you're not in a small group, that is a great way to get plugged in. Um, whether you're brand new to faith or maybe you're returning or maybe you've been in it a while but you just joined the church, we think that's a great place to start. So, Starting Point sign up is going on right now um, at the info desk. And then, more stuff to come next week. We're finalizing calendars and everything like that. So, stay tuned for some exciting stuff. Um, but that's all I have, so I'm going to say a quick word of prayer for Josh, and he's going to come up and give us a message. Um, Heavenly Father, I just want to pray for the next few minutes, God. Um, as Josh comes up, we can just um, hear your voice louder than ever before, Lord. I pray that whatever we're holding on to right now, whatever we're hesitant about to not be open to you and what you have to say to us, God, I just pray that um, that can leave our minds and that can... We can leave our struggles, Lord, and just focus on you and our relationship with you for the next 40 minutes, God. Um, I pray that Josh's voice go, grows silent and your voice grows loud. And I pray that um, whatever he says, Lord, there's something we can take and apply to our Monday through Saturday. Um, I thank you for what you're about to do, the healing, the learning, the teaching, all of it, God. Um, it wouldn't be possible without your son, and it's in his name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Kelsey. And I'm sorry. I think actually during the last worship song when we were talking about Jesus rising from the dead, Kelsey walked right in front of me and I went like this and I think I punched her in the face. So I apologize. Um, anyways, I'm excited to be back. We, uh, it's, we took last week off, um, so we didn't have church on December 29th, but we did have a Christmas service that Monday night. And we were actually praying... Uh, we were praying for 250, and uh, we had over 400 in the building that night, which is super excited. Um, yeah, so a lot of people heard about Jesus, and I'm excited uh, to dive into a new message series. And I want to start by just reading a passage of Scripture that we're going to kind of be jumping to and from over the next 30 or so minutes. And it says this, James chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. And he gives grace generously, the Scriptures say. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. And so that's where we're gonna kind of park for the next few moments together. And every, every year, at least the past few years, I've played in the Missouri Amateur Championship Golf Tournament, okay? And, uh, and it's kind of a big, at least amateur event. There are like seven local qualifiers across the state, and the top 140 golfers get to travel somewhere and play in the Missouri Amateur Championship. And so the past few years I've qualified, and I get I get so nervous, okay? I get so anxious. The weeks, leaking, the, the weeks leading up to it, I'm thinking about it nonstop. I'm all fired up. I'm all excited. And then every year I get down there, okay, I just, I get jittery, okay? I get jittery. I shake over my shots. I get really nervous. I get really anxious. I can't sleep the night before the event, literally, can't sleep, get to sleep like 5.30 in the morning, I have to wake up at 6.30, and then the second night's even worse because the second day is when you really have to play well if you wanna, if you wanna make the cut. And so, so, so if, you've, if you've been around golf for a while, you know that like amped up and jittery probably aren't words that you want to use to describe your golf game, you know? And, and I think people can see it, right? Like I'm not screaming, I'm not throwing clubs or anything, but people, I've, I've kind of developed the, the reputation of just the head case, okay? I'm kind of the head case in the St. Louis amateur golfing circuit, okay? That's, that's essentially my, my reputation. And it's funny to me, like I'm playing with, again, it's the best amateurs in the state, so you have like high school golfers who are, who are wanting to, you know, build a resume to get a scholarship, and then you have college golfers who are trying to build a resume to maybe even get an agent to try and play overseas somewhere and make their, you know, climb their way up the ranks in the, in, in the pro level, 
you know? And so they actually have something to play for. They're, win- they're, they're trying to win the trophy. It's a coveted trophy. Like, you know, there have been a lot of big names who have won the trophy. I don't even want to win the trophy, okay? I do actually, but I know I'll, I'll, I'll never be able to win the trophy, okay? I will literally never be the Missouri amateur champion. And that's okay with me, okay? Like, I just want to make the cut, okay? I want to be in the top 64, all right? And it shouldn't be that big of a deal, but I'm all anxious. And these kids got to be thinking, dude, you're 27, you're married, you have a job, you love your life. This is not a big deal, right? But I kind of just, I kind of freak out. And, and so the last few years, I have not accomplished my resolution. I have not made the cut. And it's even worse than that, okay? The last two years, true story, I've tied for 64th place, but only but only 64 can make it into the next portion of the tournament I've lost in the playoff both years. And so I get all disappointed and I get all upset and I get all frustrated and I get all angry, but not for long, you know why? There's always next year, right? There's, there's always another tournament. There's always going to be a clean slate. There's always going to be a new scorecard. There's always going to be a second, or in my case, a fourth chance to make the cut. And And there's something about a new scorecard. There's something about a new tournament. And speaking of new, there's something about the word new that just kind of is exciting. Brings about a holy expectation of what might come next. There's something about a new year. There is. There's something about a new decade. There is. We, we started the new decade this past week down at Passion Conference with 65,000 college and young adults uh, and college students and young adults. And we were in the Mercedes-Benz Arena. Literally, when the ball dropped, Hillsong United was leading, was leading us in worship. It was awesome. It was great. And one of the main emphasis at this conference that these speakers continually said was, was there, that there's a new year ahead of you. There's a new decade ahead of you. The the emphasis on new possibilities, new potential for for what my God want to do in you and through you. And that didn't surprise me. That didn't surprise me because all throughout the scriptures, we see that God is in the business of making old things new. In Isaiah, God says, look, look, I am doing a new thing. And then you move to the New Testament in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and he says this, if you're in Christ, if you're a believer in Jesus, the old is gone and the new has come. In Hebrews chapter 10, he says, not only has the new come, not only have I made you new, but you are being made new. Day by day, you're being renewed. You're becoming more and more like Jesus. He is putting aside the old and he is bringing us into a new and better future where our lives align more with our savior, Jesus Christ. And then the end of the story, Revelation, Jesus says, he will make everything new. There'll be no more tears, no more crying, no more pain. The old order of things will be wiped away and the new order of things will be ushered into the new earth and everything will be perfect. Perfect. God is the God of new. And if that's true, I think we should all be really excited for the new year. I don't think that's bad. I don't think it's bad to be fired up and excited about a, about a second chance, a new year, about what God might have for us in 2020 and in the next decade. Hear me on this. It could be your best year yet. 2020 could be your best year yet. Relationally, emotionally, most importantly, spiritually, it could be your best year yet. But I think in order for that to happen, we need to come to a realization, and that's what we're going to talk about for the next few moments. Um, How many of you guys set some New Year's resolutions for 2020? Raise your hands high. Raise your hands high. How many of you guys have broken some of those New Year's resolutions in the first five days? Okay, yes, thank you for your honesty. Um, I, I always get excited for the new year, and I, I set a bunch of New Year's goals and resolutions and aspirations, and I'm convinced that I didn't keep one of them in 2019, okay? Like if I went back and looked at my notebook that I wrote on January 1st or late December of 2018, I am pretty convinced I did not keep one of those resolutions. I wanted to dunk a basketball. I'm farther away from dunking a basketball now than I was on January 1st. Um, 
It's true. I, uh, I, 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 wanted to, I wanted to text people back more efficiently. Um, that, that hasn't happened. Um, I, 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 I wanted to maybe start writing a book, okay? I wanted to lose some, uh, a few pounds of fat and gain a few pounds of muscle, and that hasn't happened either, okay? And, and I'm probably not alone. In fact, I read a s- statistic that, that, that 90% of New Year's, resolutions, New Year's resolutions generally fail before February 1st. And we can joke about that stuff. Like, I can joke about a dunk in a basketball. Like, like I can kind of justify that, right? It's not that big of a deal, Josh. You might never dunk a basketball, you know? I can, I can just say, ah, just not that good of a texter, you know? I can kind of say, ah, oh, you're not in horrible shape. You know, you can hide it with baggy sweatshirts. You're, you're, you're fine. You're, you're fine. But what about the bigger goals? What, what about the bigger resolutions and aspirations? What about the goal that I set in January to pray more with my wife before bed? That didn't really happen. What about the res- resolution I set to, to, to pray for my friends who don't know Jesus every day? What about the resolution I made to lead Oak Bridge City with more care and diligence? Those are a little harder to justify. We don't really laugh about those, do we? And maybe you have some goals that you've been making for years and years and years to where you can step into maybe the new reality that God has for you, and you've just failed. You've just fallen short. And a realization that I've come to more so in 2019 than ever before is this. I don't have what it takes. I don't have what it takes. I don't have what it takes to be the leader I'm called to be. We can just kind of fly through these. I don't have what it takes to be the friend that I'm called to be. I don't have what it takes to be the husband that I'm called to be. I don't have what it takes to be the evangelist that I'm called to be. I don't have what it takes to be the Christian, the Jesus follower that I am called to be. I've learned this. And, and, or at least it's become more real to me. I've, I've always kind of known this. Like I've read the verse that Jesus, like Jesus literally says this in John chapter 15. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And he's not saying like, apart from me, you can't ride a bike. He's not saying apart from me, you can't drive a car or whatever. He's saying, apart from me, you aren't going to accomplish anything of eternal significance. This is what he's saying to the people that are following him. Apart from me and my grace and my power, you won't accomplish what you set out to accomplish. You, you won't. I've learned that my feeble attempts at behavior modification, my feeble attempts at doing more and trying harder and being better, I've learned that they're insufficient. And maybe intellectually I've always known that, but in 2019, God's like, I'm going to show you. <laughs> and he did. He did. And if the words of Jesus are true in John chapter 15, which I believe they are, neither do you. You don't have what it takes. Well, thanks, Josh. This is a great way to start out the new year, right? Like, this is awesome. I appreciate it. feels really good. Um, It might not feel good, but I believe it's true. And I think we all probably know this. If behavior modification was the answer, if goal setting was the answer, if trying harder was the answer, if being better was the answer, our lives would probably look a whole lot different, right? Like, I don't think that's the answer. And what if the moment, what if the moment you realize that you don't have what it takes is the moment that you have what it takes? What if in the kingdom of God, you don't have to act like you have it all together. What if in the kingdom of God, when you humble yourself and acknowledge, I don't have what it takes, is the moment that you step into the reality of having what it takes to make a massive difference in our world that will find its way, that will make its way into eternity. James James essentially lets us know that we need to accept our weakness. We need to accept our weakness. We need to humble ourselves. In fact, Paul, the Apostle Paul, okay, think about this. The Apostle Paul, even if you're not a Christian, you've, you've heard about the Apostle Paul, 
okay? He, he planted churches all across the known world in the first century. He's written half of the New Testament. If anybody had reason to brag about how he had it all together, it was him. But look at what he says in 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. I will boast about my weaknesses. I, I'm not just going to acknowledge them. I'm not just going to admit them. I'm going to boast about them. I'm going to, I'm going to take a megaphone and I'm going to scream, I'm weak. I don't, have what, I don't have what it takes to do what God has called me to do. Why would he boast about that? Why would he admit that? Why would he acknowledge that? This is countercultural. No one tells you to do this. Why? Paul gives us the reason. In fact, he talks about a thorn in his flesh, a thorn in his side. And we don't know exactly what he's referring to here, but we know that, that it represents weakness. It represents frustration. It represents the fact that there's something in his life that causes him to know that I am weak. Do you have a thorn? Do you have a struggle? Do you have a pain? Do you have an addiction? Do you have something that continually comes up that lets you know I am weak? Paul, Paul did. We don't know what it is, but Paul did. And then he says this, God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. Why? So that Christ's power may rest on me. What if that's true? What if that's true? What if the moment you realize, you know what, what I have in me on my own is insufficient? What if the moment you say that, God proves himself to be sufficient? What if the moment you say, you know what, I'm weak, God says, okay, I'm gonna show off now in you and through you, and I'm gonna display myself as really, really strong. What if that's true? What if the words of Jesus are true? Jesus is talking about hypocrites and the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day, and it's actually kind of a fun passage to read because Jesus gets really mad, and he just kind of goes off on the Pharisees and these self-righteous people, and he's like, everything they do is for show. They pray loud prayers, not so they can be close to God, but so that other people can hear them. They put Bible verses on their arms, not as a reminder or anything, anything significant in their life. They just want people to see how spiritual they are. They put these long tassels on their garments. Everywhere they go, they want to be, they want to be referred to as rabbi. They want to sit in the most important seats. They want, to, they want to prove that they have what it takes. They want to be their own savior. They look down on other people. They treat people like junk. And so Jesus is angry. They're proud. And then he says this, those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. What if that's true? What if, what if, the, what if for those of us who think, you know what, we're strong, we're great, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do all that God's called us to do by ourselves. What if no matter how hard you try and how good you think you are, you're going to be humbled? You're going to come to realize that I don't have what it takes. And what if the moment you admit that, God says, I'm going to lift you up. Now I can use you. Now, now, I, can, now I can send you out into the world in your weakness and in my power to make a massive difference in the world. What if James, what if what James says is true? He gives grace generously. He gives it out. He gives it out to his people. But God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. What if that's true? Here's what I think. If this is true, be encouraged. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. And you know what? Don't stop there. Like, like set the resolutions. Make the goals. Get excited about what God might do in and through your life. In humility, go for it. Go for it. In humility, be the best, be the best friend that you could possibly be. In humility, be the best professional that you could possibly be. In humility, be the hardest worker that you could possibly be. In humility, be the best spouse that you could be. Be the best Jesus follower you could be. 
Be the best evangelist that you could be. Be the greatest version of yourself that you could possibly be. In humility, go for it. Set out to change the world. Set out to share the story of Jesus. Set out to see lives changed in Jesus' name. Go for it. But James says, James says, be humble and then anticipate opposition. Anticipate opposition. And even if you're not a Christian, this is a principle that you know. Like if you set out to make a positive change in your life, okay, again, we're talking if you're not a Christian in the room, this has probably proved itself to be true in your life, okay? If you're not sure about this whole Jesus thing and you're like, you know what, I'm going to just kind of make a lifestyle change and and I'm going to be a little healthier. I'm I'm just going to enter into more healthy lifestyle, okay? I don't know about you, but for me, that Taco Bell sign gets a whole lot bigger, okay? Like a whole lot brighter at night, about 11.30 at night, okay? Um, I, I, you know, maybe, maybe you set out to, to, um, to be a better spouse or to be a better friend, and maybe that's the moment where the person you're setting out to love more does something really kind of stupid. And you're like, ugh, I don't know if I want to love you anymore, right? Like, like opposition at times can get in our way, our broken world, has a, has a way of just kind of getting in the way of becoming the person that you're created to be or, or however you want to word it if you're not a Jesus follower. And if you're a Jesus follower, you know that that's true, but there's, there's also something that's true and it's that we have an enemy. We have an enemy. We have a spiritual adversary. He hates us, doesn't like us, doesn't want us to become the person that we, have, that we have been created to be. He doesn't want us to become more like Jesus. He doesn't want us to reach people. He doesn't. We have an enemy. So if you set out in humility to go for it, anticipate opposition. And some of you are like, well, this is weird, okay? This is weird. If you're not a Jesus follower, maybe you're like, oh, he's gonna talk about the devil, right? Here we go. In, in, in October, Abby and, I went to, uh, Abby and I went to New Orleans, okay? And anybody ever been to New Orleans? I love it. It was so much fun. We ate some really good food. We walked around the French Quarter a bunch and just saw, it was, it was really cool. Some cool sights, some good moments. And, uh, and my favorite moment of them all, believe it or not, was the World War II Museum, okay? I loved it. I thought it was awesome. And part of the reason why I loved it so much is I remembered none of it from schools, from school, classes in high school and college. And so all of it was like, wow, this is really cool. I, could, I probably couldn't have told you anything about World War II before we went. And there's something that stuck out to me, okay, when, uh, when Woodrow Wilson uh, signed the Declaration of War. I'm kidding, it was FDR. Uh, how, how, how many of you guys thought that it was Woodrow Wilson? How many of you guys would have just gone with it? Um, okay, yeah. Uh, so FDR signed the Declaration of War and he had been putting it off. He had been putting it off. He had been putting it off. But he said, you know what? The reason he signed it, the reason he signed the Declaration of War on December 11th of 1941, I was paying attention. The reason that he signed it is because he realized he didn't have a choice. There was an enemy. There was an enemy, and it was very, very clear at the bombing of Pearl Harbor. He didn't want to have an enemy. He didn't want to have to go to war. But he realized, I just don't have a choice. It's not optional. It's mandatory. Jesus follower, warfare is not optional. It's mandatory. You have an adversary. You have an enemy and you can wish it away and you can try not to think about it because it's kind of dark and it's a little scary and it's a little weird and it's a little out there. But let's all acknowledge that we've seen it in our lives. We've seen it in our world. You have an enemy. You do. Therefore, you need to anticipate opposition. James says, resist the devil because there's a devil. If there wasn't, he wouldn't mention it. Okay, so you don't have what it takes. (laughs) There's opposition. This is really good so far. This is great. Um, But, but I want, I want to, I want to just kind of encourage you now. Okay. I want you to get excited about who you are in Christ as we step into the new year. And so I'm going to illustrate it this way, and this could be interesting. So just bear with me. Okay. So imagine that, that this is you. Okay. I don't know if we can get a good camera angle of my artwork, but This is, that's you, okay? So that's you uh, right there. And 
And, and, and Scripture talks about something that's, that's pretty wild. Um, scripture talks about a reality that is actually a mystery. It's referred to as a mystery in Colossians 1, 27. We can put that verse up there. And it's Christ, it's Christ in you. It's Christ in you, which is the hope of glory. This is your identity. This is who you are in Christ. Christ is in you. But then there's all throughout the New Testament, there are passages of Scripture that says not only, not only is God in, in you, not only is Christ in you, but you are in Christ. This is, this is who you are. So Christ in you, you in Christ. And then there's a verse in Colossians chapter 3 that we don't talk about a whole lot. and Maybe you've skipped over it. But it, it says, for you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in who? In God. So Christ in you, you in Christ who is in God the Father. And so if you don't have what it takes on your own, that's okay. It's all right. 2020, understand that's it's okay. If, if there's an opposition, if there's an enemy, if you're still wrestling with this, even if there is, if this is true, you're all right. You're all right. Just imagine with me for a moment that the enemy wants to get to you. First, he's got to go through God the Father, doesn't have a great track record with him. And then, but let's just imagine he gets past God the Father and he gets to Christ the Son. Doesn't really have a good track record with him either. He thought he won at one point. Jesus died. Enemy thought he had him. And then a couple of days later, he rises from the dead, and Scripture says that now our enemy, our adversary, sits under the feet of Jesus. But let's just imagine he makes it through Christ, the Son. Then he gets to you, who is empowered with the power of Christ, who is in you. You don't have to be afraid. If you had a really, really bad 2019 and spiritually you were apathetic and it was your worst year yet and you're like, you, you, you don't have to anticipate failure. You don't. You, you don't have to just expect that you're going to fall back into old sin and old habits. There is a power that is in and around you that is greater than anything that could come against you. This is, the, this is the gospel message. This is the good news of Jesus. He died for you. He rose for you. The moment that you believe in him, you are in Christ. Christ is in you, and you are hidden with Christ in God. There is a power that is in you and around you that is greater than anything that could come against you. Do our lives reflect that? To get more personal, does your life reflect that? How come at times, how come at times, like if this is true, if when we resist the devil, he flees from us, how come at times, you know, we, it doesn't feel like we're overcomers? Scripture says you're an overcomer. You're more than a conqueror. You can do all things. Christ who strengthens you. How come at times it doesn't feel like that? How come at times it feels like the enemy is looming how come at times it feels like we just can't overcome the sin or the difficulties or the struggles in our lives? How come at times it just feels like there's just no hope for us to become closer to Jesus? I've mentioned my last 17 sermons, I think, that I coach seventh grade basketball. Um, I'm kidding. It's been the last couple, so this is going to be the third one in a row. But I know that you're wondering how the season's going. Um, so, so we had a good win yesterday at the boys' club. Uh, it was really fun, really loud gym. We won towards the end of the game. It's a good time. Uh, we're actually on a win streak. We're 500 now um, and, uh, and four and four. And so it was a couple games to go. We were playing center St. Louis. Uh, and, and honestly, we should be about six and two. And because a couple of the games, we were winning most of the game. We kind of let the opposition kind of loom around and uh, they kind of hovered. And at the end of the game, we, we lost it due to some of my coaching, due to some missed free throws and things like that. So, so it was last Saturday, I think we were playing. And, and, uh, and we, were, we, were, we were in a game where it was like 
it just felt like it was similar to the games beforehand, okay? We were better than this team, but they just stayed close. And so then we went on a run. I, we went on a run. We got it up to 17 points. The other coach called timeout. There's like 15 minutes left in the game. We get in the huddle, and I'm like, you know what? Here's what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to put them away. We're going to press first time of the game. And so we pressed. We got a couple steals, got a couple layups. We're up 21 points. I'm able to put all the subs in. Everybody plays. We have a good time. We get a pretty stress-free win, first one of the year. And so I go, and I shake hands, and I notice the coach looks angry and he looks frustrated and then I realize he is angry and he's like why did you put on the press why did you put on the press with 15 minutes left and my best player was out in the car having an asthma attack right like why I'm like well I didn't know your best player was out in the car having an asthma attack first of all nobody informed me of that all right and then second of all we I did it so that we would definitely win right like that's, that's, what, that's why we did it. I wanted to get some subs in the game. Like we've had some games where other teams have come back. I didn't think the game was over. We did it to win. And he's like, you're a punk. He said that. That was a punk move. That was a punk move. And he's wrong. He's wrong. I'm just <laughs> venting about it. Okay? That, like, I'm not a punk. That wasn't a punk. That wasn't a punk move. It, it wasn't. But I think there's, I think there's a spiritual lesson in that somewhere. (laughs) And I think for far too many of us, if we're being honest, we just kind of let the enemy loom around. He hovers. He hovers. And I think for many of us, we just need to say, you know what, I'm going to put them away. I'm going to be done with this whole thing. I'm going to understand that Christ has won, the victory is mine, and I'm going to step into it. I'm going to quit living my life detached from the power of God. We need need to accept our weakness. We need to anticipate opposition, and we we need to access power. We need to access power. How do we do that? James says it's simple. We draw near to God, and then he'll give us more of him. He'll draw near to us. It sounds very similar to what Jesus says in John 15. He says, if you want to live a life that bears much fruit, abide in me. Be close. Be committed. Stay connected to the power source. Stay connected to the king of the universe. You don't have what it takes, but Jesus does, and he's available. His power, his grace is available to you. Stay connected to him. Guys, our world needs a powerful church. Our world needs a powerful church. Our world doesn't need a group of people that comes to church on Sundays every now and then. While I believe that's important, that's, that's, that's far from what our world needs. We should keep coming to church, but we need to understand that our call is a whole lot greater than that. Our world needs a group of people that go into our world, into our workplaces, into our neighborhoods, into our families, into our extended families with the power of God. A group of people who are ready to love, who are ready to serve, who are ready to give, who are ready to share the gospel and say, God, use me to do whatever you want to do. The world needs a powerful church. We got to stop waiting. And hear me on, on this. Abiding in Christ isn't that complicated. It's really not. I think a lot of times we try and make it complicated to where we can make excuses as to why we don't do it. Well, how do we do that? How do we, how do we stay close to Christ? We can't see him, right? Like, how do, we, how, do we, how do we abide in Christ? How do we stay close to God? We, we believe God's a person. We believe he's a personal friend, Lord, Savior, how to, to be real practical, there are really practical solutions to some spiritual questions. There are. To be real practical, how do you stay close to your friends? How do you stay close to your loved ones? You, you spend time with them, you talk to them, you listen to them, you honor them, you pursue the relationship, you move into the relationship, you, you, you put yourself out there. This is what takes place. So it is with God. You spend time with them. You open up the Bible, which is the Word of God. We'll unapologetically say that. You open it up, you look at the pages. You look at the life of Jesus, and you spend time with Him. You pray. You create margin in your world to where you can hear from God. It's really not that complicated, but while abiding in Christ is simple, it's not easy. If it was, we would all do it. Distractions get in the way. Shame gets in the way. 
Old habits get in the way. Busyness gets in the way. Stresses get in the way. And pretty soon we're back to New Year's resolutions. Trying to do it on our own. Behavior modification, trying harder, being better, doing more. Behavior modification. But the root of your problem is not behavioral. It's spiritual. And in 2020, if you resolve, if you resolve to live a life of purpose and power apart from Jesus, you will fall woefully short. So stay connected to him. Lean into him. And together as a church, let's see what God does. Father, we are grateful for who you are, for your love, for your kindness, for your grace. And uh, God, right now I admit, I acknowledge that God, apart from you, I'm weak. Continually I do things I don't want to do. Continually I don't do things that I want to do. Father, I'm like Paul at times. Who will rescue me <laughs> from this? And Paul says, thanks be to God. It's Jesus. Jesus is our rescuer. Jesus is the one who sets us free. Jesus is the one who changes us. Jesus is the one who moves us into a place of power and purpose. And so, Father, I pray that we can stay connected to him. Father, I pray that, you know what, we can make the resolutions, we can set the goals, we can be excited about 2020. But I pray that we do that in humility. I pray that we do that while we are anticipating opposition and heavy opposition. And then, Father, I pray that we can be confident that the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is alive in us. Father, Christ is in us. We are in Christ. We are hidden with Christ in God. We are secure today and forever. There is a power in and around us that is bigger and greater than anything that could come against us. And so my greatest prayer this morning as we worship, as we sing about the power of God, is that we access it. We access it. We abide. We stay close to you. We pick up your book. We sit in your presence. And we say, God, we need you. We need you. We need your love. We need your grace. There's a, there's a hurting world around us. And God, we need, we need to show them your love. We need to show them. We need to be a picture. We need to be your ambassadors. We need to be your representatives. That they have an opportunity to be connected to the God of the universe. This is a big task. And we need your help. We acknowledge that and we ask that you step into our lives and allow us to be the people that you've called us to be. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing this song. You unravel me with melody. You surround me with a song. Of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear, cause I am a child of God. I'm no chosen me love has called my name and I've been born again into your family your blood flows through my veins now I'm no longer a slave to fear cause I 
I love the term, I love the term rescue, he's rescued us. And I love the, 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 the message that Paul speaks to us in the book of Romans. He doesn't, just, he doesn't just rescue us from sin's punishment and penalty. He rescues us from sin's power, which would lead us to believe that we can actually live out the life that God's called us to live. We can step into the new reality that God has for us, we can. We just need to access the power of God. We need to stay close. We need to stay connected. And so I'd encourage you to keep coming. I'd encourage you to be here on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. And even more so than that, I think, I would encourage you to join a group. Uh, if, you're, if you're coming, if you're coming, I want to be really bold for a second. If you're coming here on Sunday mornings, you probably won't be coming here on Sunday mornings uh, eventually if you don't join a group. You won't. I believe this can get you in the front door, it's great, but I believe small groups is gonna keep the back door closed. And so I would encourage you to join a group, and one of the groups that we have available right now is our starting point group signups. If you're like, I've already done starting point, I've already been through it, the rest of our group signups will start next week. Starting point, hear me on this. If you are new to this whole thing, 
It's not intimidating. It's not super scary. We're going to watch a couple videos. We're going to have some fun conversations and we're going to eat some food. Okay. It's what we're going to do. And most importantly, we're going to learn about the basics of the faith, why we believe what we believe, the core tenets of the Christian faith. And I think it'll encourage you. I think it'll maybe change the way that you view Christianity. And I think maybe it will jumpstart a powerful faith in him. And so we would encourage you to sign up for that. And if you're like, I've already taken it, come back next week and we'll have the rest of our group sign up. So I'm going to pray for us and we're going to get out of here. Father, we uh, love you. And uh, God, if we don't, if you're like, you know, if, if someone's in the room and they hear that statement, we, uh, they're like, I don't really know if I do love them. Uh, God, I, I, I pray that you would help those people. First off, know that they're welcome, they're cared for, they're loved, but Help them know that even if, even if they don't love you, you love them. You love them. You sent your son for them. And Father, in response to that, God, I pray that every one of us can, can love you back, can give you our lives, can devote our lives to you, can begin the process of not being perfect, but can begin the process of becoming more and more of the person that you've created us to be. Father help, Father, help us. Thank you that you give us the tools to do that. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll see you back next week.